us up there, um, reminding you, of course, that the book of Ephesians was written by the Apostle Paul while he was in prison. Uh, he was under house arrest, essentially, um, along with the book of Philippians and the book of Colossians and the book of Philemon. These are called the prison letters. And uh, a few weeks ago, as we uh, looked at uh, Ephesians together, we were in Ephesians chapter 4, and we started out this chapter, the first three verses, and, and it led us, I, I believe, to ask ourselves five really important questions. And I'm going to rehash those because I think it's really important, and those are kind of background for us as we move on into the rest of the chapter uh, of Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, it starts out, it starts out, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord. Paul just reminding us of his circumstances. I, a prisoner uh, uh, for the Lord. And, and the question that leads us to ask is we... Uh, stand in our world today, am, am I willing to face momentary suffering for eternal reward? We know, of course, that this world is not our home. We, we know that, that we are called not to the temporary, but we are called to the eternal. And, and, and one of the things that I think we as Christians are going to have to ask ourselves, are, are we just going to kind of go with the flow in a culture that is increasingly turning its back on God? culture that is increasingly kind of thumbing its nose at God, so to speak. Uh, am I willing to face momentary suffering? And we know today that even, even today there are probably people whose, whose lives are in danger because they gather and worship with other believers. And we forget that sometimes, don't we? We forget that. But, you know, it, sometimes you're called to die for Christ. Sometimes you're called to live for Christ. But either way, you're called to suffer in the sense of giving up your life, giving up your life, and giving it over into His hands. Am I willing to face momentary suffering for eternal reward? How much was it worth to Paul if Jesus Christ died for him? How much was it worth to be sure that people hear the gospel? And how much was it worth that the churches had unity and hell? Paul, you know, you could have said, you could have said, Paul, why don't you just back it off a little bit? Why don't you tone it down a little bit? Why don't you just kind of blend into the scenery and, and everything will be good and you won't have, to, you won't have to, to put up with a lot of the things you're dealing with. And Paul, and Paul could knew he could never, he could never tone it down. He knew, he'd come to the realization of Jesus, who Jesus is. And he, and he met the resurrected Christ on the, on the road to Damascus. He said, I cannot, I, I cannot do anything but proclaim Him. And, and so, you know, and, and he, he writes to us then. He says to us, he says to the people he's writing to, I urge you, as a prisoner, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the call to which you have been called. Now, then he says this, with all humility, with all humility. And the question, am I willing to trade my pride for humility? And, and you know, everything around us beckons us to have a high view of ourselves. Everything around us beckons us. We're challenged to be self-sufficient. We're challenged to be self-confident. But the call of God is not to self-sufficiency, but to Christ-sufficiency. And the call of Christ is not to self-confidence, but to Christ-confidence. If we have a correct view of salvation, we will have a proper estimate of ourselves. Remember what Paul wrote when he wrote in chapter 2, in our chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians. He said, you were dead in trespasses and sins. You were uh, caught up in this world system. You were caught up under the bondage of the, the prince of this world. You were in bondage to your own desires and your own flesh. You were children of wrath. This is who you were. But God was rich in mercy, he says has made us alive in Christ Jesus. And so, where is there? We can't brag, right? There's, there's no room for anything but humility here. Of uh, recognizing who we are and that everything that we have is given to us in grace, in the grace of the Lord. But now, here's the thing I, I would say to you also. Contrary to popular opinion, humble does not mean wishy-washy when it comes to truth. We're going to see that in just a minute. Humility doesn't mean uncertainty. Humility in regards to truth means I submit to what God has called truth. 
It is humble to say, okay, the truth has been made known to me. Now I submit myself to the truth. And the question, am I willing to trade my pride, my own self-determination in life, I know what's best for me, or even, I know what's best for me, you know what's best for you. Yeah, and, 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 and when we trade that, and we say, He has proclaimed, the one who created us has come to us. He has given Himself for us. And now in humility, we submit to what He has called truth. What he has told us is true. And so, am I willing to trade my pride for humility? Then he also says, and gentleness. Remember what gentleness is. Gentleness is not kind of, you know, like water, just kind of going every which way every, everybody wants you to go and just sort of going along with the flow. No, gentleness is power under control. The picture is of an animal that is tamed so that it accomplishes what it was created to accomplish. It's like a wild horse that is brought under uh, that is that is brought under control. It's tamed so that it can do what it was created to do, and that's what gentleness is for us. It's not us. It's it's not us just going along with the flow and letting everything push us along. But it is it is it is brought under control. It is tamed. We are tamed under Jesus Christ. And we are called to gentleness. Am I willing to trade self-determination for a cooperative spirit? Gentleness is, is bringing ourselves under control of Christ. And then he says, with patience, bearing with one another in love. And, and, and that there, and that is, he's saying, am I willing to trade being offended for the promise of developing others? Because when we talk about patience and bearing with one another in love, we all know that people take time, right? You take time. I take time. <laughs> right? To, to, to be transformed, to be changed, for my life to be brought where God would want it to be brought. It, it doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes we give up on people way too early. We size them up, and if they don't fit what we think ought to be, we give up. But you know what? We are called to patience in Christ. Listen to what he, he wrote. 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul writes, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle. In other words, sometimes people need a kick in the seat of the pants. Encourage the faint-hearted. Sometimes people are discouraged and disheartened. Encourage them. Help the weak. Maybe they're weak physically. Maybe they're weak in their faith. Help them. And, and then be patient with them all. Why? Because all of us need patience. Right? Sometimes people ask me, you know, they say, how do you stay in the same church as pastor for 22 years? And I say, because there are really patient people there. I take a lot of patience. But I'll let you in on a secret. So do you. All right? And the Lord is patient with us all. And, 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 and so we realize that's not weakness. Patience is not weakness. Patience is strength. And so he says, with bearing with one another. I mean, you're bearing up under. Sometimes you're carrying your load with somebody else's too. Bearing with one another. And the drawstring in all of this is love. It's all drawn up in love. And so we bear with one another. We put up with each other. This is what it takes to be the church. I mean, if you're really going to be the church, I'm not talking about just a group of people who, who put their name on the roll and come in with their name put their backside on the seat every now and then. I'm talking about the real church. This is what it takes to be the church. You put up with each other. And you grow in relationship with each other. It takes that in a family. It takes that in the church. If you have children, you know you have to bear with them sometimes. If you have parents, you know you have to bear with them sometimes. Right? And this is what it takes for us to follow the Lord together. Patiently bearing with one another in love. And then he says, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And what he's saying, eager there, is really in strongly endeavoring. It's not just a, a act, it's actively endeavoring. It's not just you know, being eager in your, in, in, inside, on the inside. It's eager on the outside. To do what? To maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We can't make the unity that is given to us as the church. It's a gift from God. It's a supernatural unity. 
You can't create it. Neither can I. But we can maintain it. We can steward it. We can shepherd it. And that's what He's calling us here to do. And so the question, am I willing to set aside personal agenda for the sake of God's greater plan for my life and for His people? Life is so empty when I live it for me. Or when I live it for... And there, there's a higher purpose. There's a higher call for you and me. God's greater plan. That's what the rest of Ephesians is all about. It's about unity. It's about living interdependently. We no longer live in isolation. We're interconnected with each other. So that Paul is going to use words like the body. He's going to use words like family to describe the church. Grace comes in and reconciles us to God, but also reconciles us to one another. Remember, that's what chapter 3, the chapter, last part of chapter 2 and chapter 3 was all about. No longer Jews and Gentiles, but it's Jews and Gentiles coming together as a new people. All people, every tribe, every tongue, every nation coming together under Jesus Christ. The unity that would even break down the barriers between Jews and Arabs. That would break down the, the, the barriers between races. That would break down the barriers between people who are of different cultures and different backgrounds. Even break down barriers between people who once were warring with each other. Now who come together under one head. And that is Jesus Christ. And so we're called to set aside our own personal agendas. Because those personal agendas are what got us in the mess we were in to start with, right? Remember the Garden of Eden? Adam said, you know, God says, Adam, why'd you eat that fruit? Well, the woman you gave me. And Eve, why did you? But, well, that, that snake. I don't know if she's talking about Adam or who, but, but anyway, you know, that, and, 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 you know, so what do we do? We blame each other. We we look at we look at you. No, it's no longer that. We do what's good, not for ourselves, but for others. We set aside our personal agendas, understanding that living for yourself is what gets you in the mess you're in. We were never intended to live in isolation. We're called to set aside those agendas and do that for who for what? We do that for him who died for us. Remember, he died for all that those who, who live might no longer live for themselves, but for Him who for their sake died and was raised. So we do it for Him, for Christ, and we do it for the Gospel. He said to the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the Gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. So I do it for Christ, I do it for the Gospel, and we do it for the church. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of His body, which is the church. That's why we're willing to lay something on the line. We do it for Christ who died for us. We do it for the gospel, the truth of the gospel. We do it for the church. And all three of those are intertwined with each other. And the reason and the purpose of our life takes on a whole new direction. It's no longer for me. It's no longer for personal gain. It's no longer for what I get. It's for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of His church. Now, they, they, these are five foundation stones of Christian unity. And, and where these are absent, there can be no external unity. There can be no unity. Uh, but, but when this strong base has been laid, when there is a willingness to lay our lives on the line, when there is humility, when there is gentleness, when there is patience, when there is in us a desire to maintain the unity that has been given to us, when this strong base is laid, there is a good hope for visible, visible unity that that can be built. And the need for unity, listen, the need for unity is intensified in the world in which we find ourselves, right? We need to band together. We need to be brothers and sisters Christ. And we need to recognize that and celebrate that like we've never celebrated it before. But I want to give you some warning before we move into this whole thing about unity. I want to warn you that there are those uh, who say that we need to set aside everything else for the sake of unity. 
even truth. That we set aside even the essential elements of the Word of God. We set aside these, the elements of the Gospel for the sake of love. Because isn't that what would elevate us in the eyes of the world? We would just set aside everything else for the sake of unity. There are those who say, put aside all doctrine, put aside all truth for the sake of unity. But there, that, is, that is a false unity. It would be, it's sort of like a body without bones. And can you imagine over in the corner just like a big old puddle of, of something? But without without the, the essential truths of the gospel, there is nothing on which to build unity. I, I heard someone say that it would be sort of like us saying, okay, I've got this neighbor that's just moved in across from me and I want to be good friends with my neighbor. And I go to the neighbor and I say, how can we build a friendship here? And the neighbor says, well, you've got to give away your kids. Because we don't like kids. If we give up the truth, we're giving away. It's like giving away the children, folks. For people who don't even like the kids. Who don't like the truth. And so we recognize, we recognize how essential it is that we hold on to truth. And in fact, real unity for the church is established and maintained in the essential truths that are set here before us. And each of these elements of unity has a tremendous implication for our lives. And that's what we're going to move into right here. He says, as he follows all this up, he says there is one body. Now I want you to notice all the way down through here, the word one. O-N-E, one. And that's not a very popular word in our world, right? No, there are many. There, you have yours, I have mine. And, and, and somehow they all get us to the same place. There's, you know, and to say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through Him, it is, that, that, that goes against the grain of the culture in which we live, right? But over and over here, as Paul said, this is... This is what establishes unity. This is where our unity leads us to. These are the truths of our unity. One. There is one body. One body. And he's speaking here of the church, right? And that, that one body is for the sake of our mutual care. And, and, and in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul writes, But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. So, there may, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. We have one body for our mutual care. And every cell in the body shares in that mutual life. You know, the old saying, the old uh, song, the knee bone connects to the thigh bone and the thigh. You know, that's, that's not how a body works, right? The body starts out as a single cell and grows in a miraculous way, an amazing way. That life that is, that is given by God grows in the womb in an amazing way. And every part of the body is just as vital a part of the body as, other, as the other parts. There's a mutual life that we share in the body. And so we are one body. There, it, it, and and every, every part of us shares in that mutual life that we've been given. You know, we live in a world that is saying increasingly that the church is passe, that the church is irrelevant. In fact, you know, that, that, uh, uh, that research that I, that I pointed you to a little bit earlier, the Pew research that I pointed you to a little earlier, tells us that every facet of the church or every part of what would be called the church, whether it be the mainline churches or the evangelical churches or in Catholicism. Catholicism has dropped off in the last seven years. Those who claim to be Catholics dropped, have dropped off 3%. Those who claim to be mainline have dropped off 4%. Mainline churches. That's uh, well, you, you look that up what that means. But, but then those who call themselves evangelical Christians have dropped off the last seven years. The numbers have dropped down 1%. Every facet of the church. The only thing on that research that has grown are those who call themselves unaffiliated. The nuns. And they have grown over the last seven years by 6%. The unaffiliated. And what we're saying is that we can somehow have God. Many of them would say, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus Christ, but we can have Him without the church. 
But here Paul says there's one body. And, and we, we need to understand, we need to recognize, listen, that, that, uh, that we are, that even though our, our numbers may be decreasing, even though in some ways our numbers may be decreasing, our strength is not decreasing. Look at what he said, and one spirit. And one spirit. One spirit for the sake of our power. The strength of the church has never been in numbers. The, the strength of the church is not measured in how many people that, that are part of, of that local church, nor how many, how many are, are in the, the church as a whole, in a nation or wherever. And even though there may be a decrease in the numbers of those who call themselves a part of the church, that, that does not diminish our power. Our power is in the Spirit of God. Right? Our power is in the Spirit of God. At one point in the Old Testament, Zechariah, the Old Testament prophet, saw a vision. And, and, he, and the vision was of a mountain that was unscalable, impassable. And, and, and God says in the vision to him that he's going to make this mountain into a plain. He's going to flatten out the, the mountain. And Zechariah is wondering, how are you going to do this? How is this going to happen? And here's what God says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Listen, the strength of the church is not measured in numbers. The strength of the church is measured in the Spirit of God. And we, and we listen, regardless of the era, the Spirit of God is the same Spirit, right? One Spirit. There is one Spirit. He, we find our strength in Him. And regardless of what's going on around us, we, that, that does not change, folks. Let's not put our head in our hands and and, and, and cry because suddenly there, some of the some of the numbers, whether it be pure research or whatever numbers, might not say what we'd like them to say. But let's put it, let's lift up our heads and look, look at our king who's coming through the gate. And look at let's lift up our eyes and see the one who is our glory. And let's lift up our eyes and understand that the same spirit that was with, the, was with the church in the time of the Apostle Paul is with the church today and will be with the church until the coming, the, the end of this age comes. So, one spirit for the sake of our power. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. And one hope here is talking about confidence. For the sake of our confidence. One hope. You know, hope for the Christian is, is not... Uh, well, I hope it doesn't rain today because I've got picnic plans. That's not, that's not the kind of hope it's talking about. It, hope for us as Christians, hope in the New Testament hope is this. God said it, and so I expect it to happen. That's New Testament hope. Say that with me. God said it, so I expect it to happen. All right, when God speaks, that is our hope. Our hope is in the Word of God. Our hope is not in public opinion. Our hope is not in what's going on around us. Our hope is in Him. And that is our hope for our mission so that we are not afraid to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are not afraid to do what He has called us to do. That is our hope. We have the same mission regardless of what's going on around us. We have confidence in our mission. You're familiar with these words, right? Paul, writing again from prison, he's writing to the church at Philippi, and he says, It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That is our hope. It doesn't change with the winds of time. It doesn't change with what's going on around us. Our hope is in Him. And in what He has said. That He will do what He says He will do. And then our hope is in our future as well, right? We have hope today in our mission, but we have hope in our future. Paul wrote to the church of Corinth. He said, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all men to be most pitied. But our hope is not just confined to this life. This world is not our home. And so we recognize that there is going to come a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
our hope is in this, that, that one day we will see Him and we will be like Him when we see Him as He is. Our hope is in this, that one day every, that, that He will wipe away every te tear from our eyes and, and, he, and he, there will be no more sickness and there will be no more sorrow and there will be no more death for the former things that passed away. Our hope is not in this life. But our hope is in the life to come. And we have hope in our mission, knowing that we have been called, what we have been called to, He will give us the strength to do. But our hope is ultimately in what He has prepared for us. We have hope. That is our confidence. And then He says, One Lord, one Lord, one Lord for the sake of what? For our authority. What is our authority? Is our authority public opinion? We have politicians today. I guess they've always been around. It just seems like it's more prevalent today. And I'm talking about politicians on both sides of the fence and whatever you whatever your bent is on that, you know, equal opportunity here, okay? Politicians who say that one thing on an issue today, and when they get the public polls and those public polls have changed, they do a 180. They do something totally opposite. They speak totally opposite about the very same issue. What is that? That's cowards. Nothing short of being a coward. How can you be a leader and say one day something's right and then the next day because somebody says it's not popular any longer? Change. And I'll, I'll just say to you folks, we have one authority. And our authority is not what the new, latest newspapers say. Our authority is not what the public opinion polls say. Our authority is in Christ Jesus as Lord. We have one Lord, one King. This is why the early Christians could not bow down and say Caesar is Lord. And that is why we could not bow down and say public opinion is Lord. In gentleness and humility and in patience, we stand in Him. He and He alone is our authority. One Lord. And He asks us the question, but why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not do what I tell you. Lordship must include obedience, right? I mean, otherwise He's just Lord in name. You can name the name Jesus as Lord. But not until we say, I will do what you say, can we truly say, Jesus Christ is Lord. But Jesus also said this, speaking of example, He said, you call me teacher and you call me Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I am then your Lord and teacher and washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. He is Lord in that we obey Him. He is Lord in that we follow His example. We walk in His way. And one day there will be no question, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But listen, we know that now. We don't have to wait. Why are we fiddling around with a lot of other things? Why are we allowing ourselves to be brought up under other things? There is one Lord. One Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Say it with me. Jesus Christ is Lord. That has been the echo down through the centuries from the true church. Jesus Christ is Lord. In, time, in, in cultures that were friendly to, to Christianity and in churches that were unfriendly to Christianity. That has not changed. Jesus Christ is Lord. There is one Lord. And then he says, one faith. One faith for the sake of our protection. And one faith here I believe he's talking about is not faith like everybody believes in, in, in Him. That would be true. Those who are truly the church believe in Him. But it's talking about here a body of truth. Okay? It's talking about the truth. It's talking about what we, we would call our Bibles. We have something unique, whether you realize it or not. You know, many, uh, down through the ages, many uh, 
Christians have not always had access to the Bible like we have access to the Bible. And yet they understood that there was one truth. The true church came up under that truth. And as it was revealed to them, they came up under it and they walked in it. God wrote the word, the laws upon their hearts. There are many places in the world that they don't have Bibles. They don't have access to the Bible. But they come up under the Lordship of Jesus Christ in one truth, one faith, one body of truth. They are the true church. One faith. And this for the sake of our protection. God has spoken through the prophets and the apostles. It is one faith for all people. It is a cross-cultural body of truth that brings hope to all people who hear and who submit. But you know what? As soon as Paul would establish a church anywhere, as soon as in the New Testament they established a church somewhere, what happened? Do what, Marissa? False teachers. False teachers moved in, right? Now, why is that a big deal? I mean, it's true, it's true, right? As long as it's your truth, my truth, it's all just, it's all good, right? Is that right? I mean, the, the analogy is as simple as this. You know, if you're in the woods and, and you're lost in the woods and, and you, don't, you don't need to know the name of every tree, but you do need to know the pathway out. And the only thing you need to be and the, the thing we need to be concerned about is the pathway out. There's one pathway. His name is Jesus. And, and, and the body of truth that comes up around him, the gospel, the essential truth, they are not up for grabs, folks. There's some things that we might not really understand fully enough to, to come to consensus on, like exactly what order is the second coming going to come in, and, and, and exactly that there are, but listen, there are essential truths that are not up for grabs. There are people who say, well, we ought to just get along with everybody who, you know, who wants to do good in our world. And listen, we can come alongside people and beat the hungry and clothe the, and clothe the naked and, and, and house those who have, who need housing, we can do that, but we cannot evangelize with people who do not espouse these essential truths because they are taking people in a different direction than what we are. And so, we, you know, otherwise we're sort of like the old saying that the man who got on two horses and rode off in different directions it doesn't work very well. We have one body of truth, one faith, and Paul, when he wrote to the church at Galatia, was concerned about the church there because they had bought into what is, was called, uh, uh, he calls a, a false gospel. Listen to what he says. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be what? Accursed. I want you to understand, folks, how important this is. Please hear me. If I, if I could jump up and down, if I could wave my arms, if I could jump the pews, I don't know, maybe not there. But anyway, listen to me. You are vulnerable to be led astray if you do not know the essential truths of the gospel. And listen to me. Some of us are sitting in here more concerned about what we're going to have for lunch. Or I should have worn green today. Or, or, or I, I, hope, I hope that girl really likes me. And we're more concerned. Listen, we're more concerned about those things than we are the essential truths of the Word of God. And so we sit and we have a Bible to hold in our hands and we have more than one. How many of you have more than five Bibles in your house? Look at, look at that. All right. and, we, and, and we are not, we're not concerned enough to open it up and read and learn and grow. And I say this, I say this with love. Please hear me. I'm not harping here. I'm speaking with love. In this world in which we live, you are vulnerable to be led astray if you do not know 
what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is false. And Paul, every time he went to a church and he began to, and he began to preach and he walked away, somebody came in. Listen, we have false teachers in our world today too, right? You better believe it. They put, they put Christian on their name. They put church on their building. They have lost the essential truths of the gospel. And what, they, what God calls wrong, they call right. And what God calls right, they call wrong. Please hear me. We must apply ourselves to the one faith. Young men, young women, you are being, you've been brought up in a world that says everything's relative. Everything is all like water. Whichever just flow, whichever way is easy. Please hear me. You will wake up one day and you'll be lost in the woods and you won't know the way out. There is one Lord, one faith, one faith. Paul is going to say to the Ephesian church at a point as we go forward in this book, he says, until we all attain the unity of faith. This is the goal. We come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed and to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. I'm not a conspiracy theorist except on this level. There has always been a conspiracy. There was a conspiracy in the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve fell for it and people have been falling for it ever since. And we've got to open our eyes and understand that not everybody who claims to have truth and not everybody who calls himself Christian and not everybody who puts church at the end of the name Speaking truth. And we must have discerning spirits, discerning eyes, discerning ears to know the truth, to know what is right and what is wrong. One faith. Then he says, one baptism. One baptism for the sake of our identity. Now, some, some say that this baptism is talking about here is baptism in the spirit. And I'm talking about like the second blessing baptism. But saying that this is baptism at the point where you became a Christian you were baptized by the Holy Spirit. The moment you came to Christ you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Not later. Not, you know, not okay I prayed hard and God poured something out on me. Uh, yeah, that, that's not what it's called. It, we, we see that, that that's given to you at the moment of salvation. But I don't think that's what it's talking about. I think here he's talking simply about identifying with Christ in baptism. And, and, and one baptism for the sake of our identity. Think of it like this. Like an army putting on a uniform to designate. This is who. This is who I'm fighting for. That's what baptism is all about. I want you to know that somewhere in the world today, somebody is going to be persecuted because they step across the line. They no longer just say, well, I have Jesus in my life. But as an outward sign of that, they step across the line and they are baptized as a believer in Jesus Christ. At that moment, they've identified with Jesus Christ. At that moment, they will begin to be persecuted. Baptism has always mattered. Even the world realizes the importance of baptism. And will persecute those who are baptized. If you have not been baptized, why are you waiting? Do you need to pray, God, help me to know whether I should be baptized or not? I think not. He's made that pretty clear. Bapt baptism, baptism is identifying with Christ. It doesn't make you more saved. It just says, I'm identifying with the one who saved me. In obedience. In obedience. As he's called to be baptized. 
one baptism. All the way through the New Testament we read such things as this. That when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the, the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. Both men and women. Believers baptism. Believers baptism. Except stepping across the line, identifying with Jesus Christ. Putting on the uniform of the armor that you serve. And then, listen, it says, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. One God and Father for the sake of our courage. Of our courage. Think of it like this. The little, the little boy who's you know, being bullied. And, and, and he's about ready to back down from the bullies. And then over in the corner of his eye, he sees his daddy coming. And he stands up to the fight. I'm telling you, we may live in a world that, that, that is increasingly in opposition to all of these things we're talking about here today. But our daddy's coming. In fact, he never left. He promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And though we may stand up under opposition, uh, we have one Father. One Father. We do not need to be afraid. Listen to this. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. He is your Father. He is my Father if you're in church today. You're a part of the church. You do not need to be afraid. You do not need to be afraid. Seventeen times, or excuse me, six times in John chapter 17, Jesus, Jesus prayed, Father. He called on Him, Father. You know, I used to, I, I, I remember in the church where I grew up, there was a guy that would call him to pray every now and then. And, here's, and every, other, every other sentence was this, Lord, Heavenly Father, you know, help the sick. Lord Heavenly Father. Lord Heavenly. And I used to kind of get frustrated. I'd say, you know, that, that it just drove me crazy. I'm saying, what, what are you just trying to fill in the blanks here or what? Lord Heavenly Father. Lord. But you know what? We need to call on Him. Our Lord Jesus, who six times in what is what we call the Lord's Prayer in John 17, as He's crying out to His Father, calls Him to Father. Do you know what? When he teaches us how to pray, he says, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven. Our Father. Listen, we, we're going, I don't think we're going to, we've seen the end of, of, of opposition. I don't, know what, I don't know what's going to happen. There could be revival in our country. Things could turn toward the Lord. It's happened in the past. It could happen again. We don't know. We don't know. But if things continue as they are, the world in which you live, young people, the world in which you grow up, is going to be increasingly in opposition to you saying one anything. And you need to decide today. You need to decide now. Are you going to be like water just taking the, the least resistance, the, the, the direction of least resistance? Are you going to stand? Paul said, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. In humility, in jealous, in patience, in unity, stand. One, 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 one. I heard somebody this past week describe the circumstance that we find ourselves in as American Christians like this. I think it really, it really spoke to me. It said, you know, it's like, okay, you grew up in East Tennessee, like I did. Went to the, the, the Tennessee football game. I'm sorry for those of you who are fans of other teams. Fill in your team. It's okay. You know, uh, we'll, 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 we'll have prayer for you later if I heard you. But anyway, uh, you know, that, so we got, we got the, we'll go over to the Neyland Stadium. You've been going since you were a kid. And, and every time there are certain things you can count on there, you walk in and there, the color's orange. The song's Rocky Talk. Uh, the, you know, the end they play the Tennessee Waltz. Uh, Smokey's Bay down on the tarmac. Um, uh, and, and some of you uh, were around, you remember the, the Tennessee Walking Horse. 
house. You know, do you remember all those things and all the pageantry and walk in? I'm home. This is home. But let's imagine that you walk in this September of the Oklahoma game and everything's red. And they're singing Boomer Singer. And you're thinking, what have they done with, with my home? This was home. This was my home stadium. What have they done? And you wake up from your dream and you realize it was never your home to start. We need to wake up, folks, and realize this world is not our home. We need to wake up and realize that it, it doesn't matter what the polls say. They may shift. It's still not our home. Things may go from being increasingly unfriendly to the church, to everything's all about us. We may be able to somehow vote the right people into office and muster up enough strength that we turn the tide. But it's still won't be our home. We are strangers. We are here for a long while. And from that Vantage point, Paul says, I write to you a prisoner the Lord Jesus Christ. When we wake up and understand that, it will change. It will change everything. We'll no longer, the, the real church will stand up. The, the real church won't just be people with the names on roll or with their backsides in a seat like a few Sundays every now and then. The real church will be the ones who understand that there is one. There's one Lord, one Spirit, one faith, one baptism, one, 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 one. And I just wonder, is that you? Are you willing to stand there? Even in the midst of what's happening around us in our world. Stand there in humility. Stand there in gentleness. Stand there in patience. Stand there in unity. Are you willing to stand?